virus worldwide and 3 million of them have died. 150,000 of them in this country alone, which make, gives us the highest death toll in Europe. In addition, in countries where the virus has been allowed to circulate more or less freely, uh, like this country, tens of millions of people have been made unemployed, millions evicted and huge numbers have had their pay cut. Almost everywhere, ethnic minorities um, and black people have been much harder hit. Disabled people have been completely neglected and left to die in huge numbers. Women are being forced back into caring roles as pu the public sector retreats and young people are facing a grim future. Tonight, we're going to discuss why it doesn't have to be this way, why people must be defended and what we should do from here. We've got a great lineup of speakers uh, for you. Um, because we're running a little bit behind, we're going to get straight into it. Our first speaker is Richard Bergen, MP, who is a stalwart of the Zero COVID campaign. Richard has another commitment straight after this, so we'll hear from, briefly from him about how other countries have uh, managed much better um, during the pandemic than we have and what we still need to learn from them. Richard. Thanks very much, Bal, and thanks to the uh, Zero COVID Coalition for the uh, invitation to tonight's event. And big thanks to uh, Diane, uh, Mick, uh, and all Dan's team, and Ben, and everyone involved with this are uh, doing brilliant work uh, with it, and it's very necessary. Now, I'm really sorry that, as uh, Bella's mentioned, uh, after I've spoken, I've got to leave, I do have a diary clash, and I need to be another, uh, at another event. But if any of the campaigns on the panel tonight want me to raise their issues in Parliament to put down questions, then please just get in touch. You have my support. Now, we know uh, that, as Bell has mentioned, our country has tragically had one of the highest death rates in the world, over 100,000 lives lost unnecessarily. We know this, but I think we should never stop saying it. We should never get tired of saying it because we need to keep saying it if we're going to really learn the lessons from this crisis. If we are to reverse the policies and the deep inequalities that led to this social crisis, that's what we need to do. If we're to put an end to the privatisation of the National Health Service and social care, the cuts to our welfare state, the terrible working conditions that many face, and we know that the government's terrible handling of this pandemic has not just created a public health emergency, it's created a social emergency too. A social emergency worsened by the government's catastrophic handling of the crisis, which, as even the Office of Budget Responsibility says, led to one of the worst economic downturns of any major economy. Now, of course, for some, this pandemic actually hasn't been half bad at all. In fact, it's been a very good crisis for some. It's been good for those like Serco and the others that have been able to use the crisis to get their hands on contracts to boost their profits contracts that should have gone to the NHS and local health teams. But whilst the super rich and the well connected have been able to profit out of this crisis, the government has washed its hands of others who really do need support. This crisis hasn't only highlighted the deep inequalities in our society, it's exploited those deep inequalities in our society with deadly consequences. We know, don't we, that you are much more likely to die if you are black, disabled, working in manual work, or living in overcrowded housing. COVID deaths have been over twice as high in the most deprived communities as in the better off. Workers on the zero hour contracts and working in other insecure jobs are much more likely to have died as those in other occupations. And a recent classified government report acknowledged all of this, but the government is not doing anywhere near enough about it. So this really must be a moment when we place inequality, grotesque inequality, at the heart of the national political debate. And it's up to us to be leading the charge collectively for a more equal society coming out of this crisis. Yet at the moment, these deep, inequalities are actually being entrenched further. For example, just this month, millions relying on benefits like ESA for disabled and sick people got a pathetic, insulting 
unacceptable 37 pence increase in their benefits. What an absolute insult to almost 2 million disabled people and to their families, especially especially after people on such benefits have already been refused the £20 additional payments that went to those on universal credit, which of course itself is not enough. With that 37 pence increase, the government is deliberately punishing disabled people at a time when six in 10 people who have died from COVID have been disabled people. Also this month, the government increased the minimum wage but it refused to do so for those on furlough. Now, there are over a million people on furlough who for over a year have been getting less than the minimum wage. Now, it's called the minimum wage for a reason. There should have been a furlough wage floor guaranteeing that not a single person in this country was on less than the minimum wage, but instead furloughed minimum wage workers they're falling further and further behind those still earning their full salaries. And on the subject of sick pay, this month the government increased sick pay, but by an insulting 50 pence per week or seven pence per day. Now the government knows, they know it, that without real financial support, you're fighting this disease with one hand tied behind your back. The government knows the £500 isolation payment is too low and too many are refused it. The government knows that statutory sick pay should be at real living wage levels, as it is in other countries. The government knows that it's a public health risk when people are forced to choose between putting food on the table and isolating to stop the virus from spreading. But without action, this situation won't change. So I think we need to be, at this moment, tackling head-on those grotesque inequalities illuminated, exacerbated and used during this COVID crisis. That's why yesterday I brought an amendment to Parliament for a new 55% income tax on those earning over £200,000. More than a measure to help pay off the deficit. This actually was a measure to help kickstart the debate on inequality and what we're gonna do about it. Because decades of so-called trickle-down economics, when you let the rich become as rich as they want and somehow everybody else benefits from it, that's actually led to inequality, spiraling out of control to grotesque proportions and with deadly consequences. So we need to be proposing, proposing solutions to it. For example, a windfall tax on the companies that have made super profits during this crisis. And we need to be calling for huge investment in a social security system that actually protects people so that when the next social emergency or public health emergency hits, they are properly protected. And just to end, we can't talk about inequalities without addressing the issue of vaccine inequality globally. Public money funded the vaccines, yet private control of the patents is stopping production being ramped up to vaccinate the whole world. The only thing, let's be clear, the only thing stopping everyone in the world getting a vaccine soon is that those patents are controlled by a few pharmaceutical giants. Are we going to let that risk the death of so many more people worldwide? We just can't. That's why we need a people's vaccine. So let's ramp up the pressure for our government to back the international calls led by South Africa and over 50 other countries to temporarily waive the patents. A group of former world leaders and Nobel laureates last week backed its call. It's a great moral crusade of our time and it's one that I believe that we can win. So let's ramp up the pressure on our government. Many lives in this country and around the world depend on it. Thank you very much, uh, Richard, and thank you for, for being with us today. We're gonna go straight on to our next speaker, who is uh, Diane Abbott MP, uh, another stalwart of the campaign and one of its co-founders. She's going to briefly explain the current political situation 
in relation to COVID and how that might change. Diane. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I'd like to thank you all for coming um, to this important meeting about defending those hardest hit during this COVID pandemic. I think there are at least two issues when you're looking at those hardest hit, but one single internationalist perspective. The first issue is all of the thousands of people who have died because of COVID. Those who remain seriously ill, including the victims of long COVID that we don't hear enough about, and their relatives and loved ones who have suffered so much. The second issue is an economic issue. It's about all the people who have suffered indirectly because of the deprivations that have taken place under the cloak of COVID. This includes vast numbers of people who've been made unemployed or homeless, all those threatened with fire and rehire, all those who have had their pay cut and the desperate plight of young people who have been forced back into the classroom or are being ripped off by colleges and universities who see these students as a, a source of money, uh, presumably, and those young people's job prospects currently look very bleak. So whether you're suffering from COVID medically or whether you're suffering from COVID economically, you are all the victims of this government's policies. This is not just some random pandemic which nobody could have anticipated. This is a government which has absolutely Absolutely fail to suppress the virus as other countries like New Zealand have successfully done. It's also handed over a test and trace to its cronies in the private sector. So we don't have an effective test and trace system, no proper quarantine and self-isolating isn't work because ordinary working people in this country simply can't afford to do it. And in those two categories, both people who've suffered physically and medically from COVID and those who have suffered economically from COVID. It is those who are already discriminated against who are bearing the heaviest burden, black and Asian people, disabled people and the poor. The government has allowed inequality to run rampant along with the virus itself. And this is a self-same government which has cut pay to 80% and which tried to go even lower. It allows fire and rehire. It is also this government which is imposing a pay freeze in the public sector. And it is this government that is allowing huge numbers of people to be evicted, even in a pandemic. This is a government and its media allies that is pretending that vaccines are a magic bullet. But they're not. Vaccines are very important and extremely valuable. And I have been fortunate to have both my first and my second vaccination. And I would urge everyone to take a jab when they are offered it. But vaccines cannot protect everyone. No vaccine ever does. And many people can't take them for medical reasons. Children are not vaccinated. And tragically, we see children dying in this country. I said at the outset, there were two issues, the medical effects of COVID and the economic effects of COVID, but one internationalist perspective. This is a global pandemic. And that means that no one is safe until we are all safe. We have just passed the grim milestones of 140 million cases globally and 3 million dead. And cases are still rising in countries like the US and Chile, who have vaccinated large numbers of people, as large proportion of their populations as we have here. What that means is we cannot rely on vaccines alone. It also means that rich Western countries like the UK should not hoard vaccines. In fact, the British government should do the opposite, which is to insist on patent waivers for vaccines so they can produce 
so they can be produced generically and cheaply. It is an appalling situation if rich Western countries are allowed to put the profits of international drug companies ahead of the lives of ordinary people. There should be maximum international cooperation and maximum suppression of the virus here in the UK. The government should do what it has so far failed to do, which is learn from the success of others. We can learn from countries in other parts of the world who have successfully suppressed the violence. And we must learn that if the world as a whole is to be safe, we cannot hoard vaccines. So we really are all in this together. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, Diane. You're absolutely right. We are all in this together right across the world. Our next speaker is going to be Dr. DP, Deepti sorry, Gurdasani, who is a senior lecturer at Queen Mary University in London. Um, she's previously made one of the most telling and insightful contributions in all the meetings um, we've had. And tonight she'll be drawing on her research which will provide an insight into the current spread of the infection in this country and our future prospects. Dr. Deepti. I'm just sharing some slides. I hope that's okay. Yep, yeah, that's great. Thank you. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay. So I just want to give a quick overview of uh, where we are and what the future might hold. Um, and also talk about sort of who's been affected um, most by the approach taken to the pandemic so far. So in terms of uh, where we are in terms of, uh, you know, global pandemic control, we've had so the highest deaths across the globe per unit population. We've had more than 150,000 deaths now according to the Office for National Statistics. And, uh, you know, we don't, we shouldn't just count deaths. We have over a million people now estimated to be living with long-term effects of infection today. Um, we've done quite well in terms of vaccination. So vaccine rollout uh, that's been undertaken by the NHS has been one of the few successes of uh, UK pandemic policy. And what we find here is that about 50% of our population have now received a single dose of vaccine. Um, and um, before I talk about the sort of UK picture, I, I do want to touch a little bit upon the global picture to talk about what the impact of the lack of control of the pandemic in the UK has been across the globe. We've often talked about, or at least I've heard the Prime Minister talk about, uh, you know, the third wave of uh, uh, the pandemic um, washing up on our shores. Uh, I think we often forget the cause of this third wave. In December, many scientists essentially warned that the new variant that had adapted within the UK could cause devastation across the globe if it wasn't contained within the UK. Unfortunately, due to um, the lack of our control of the pandemic, this variant is now widespread, dominant across much of the globe, including Europe and the US, and has spurred third waves now across the world. And that is very much linked to um, the, the failed strategy to control the pandemic within the UK uh, over the last year. So why are we here? Um, we never prioritize pandemic control. Even now, if you look at our strategy easing out of lockdown, we have a strategy of living with the virus and acceptable deaths. Uh, key to the strategy is essentially not keeping cases under control or keeping our rates down. The strategy is entirely dependent on not over overwhelming NHS capacity. Um, which is exactly the strategy that's brought us the number of deaths and the number of people living with long COVID that we have so far. Um, I also question what we mean by not breaking NHS capacity, given we have probably the longest waiting lists we've had in the NHS and many people impacted by that already within the UK. So I would argue that NHS capacity is already overwhelmed. Um, we, we've also never prioritized uh, school mitigations, never accepted that transmission is happening in schools, which has uh, really led our pandemic getting out of control time and time again. We still don't have a robust test, trace and isolate system, despite having invested billions into it. 
I'm not sure, billions or millions <laughs> into it. And um, lack of border restrictions and quarantines. Uh, and, you know, we're seeing the impact of this right now, which I'll talk about later. And the question is, when we talk about acceptable deaths, who's going to die and who's going to be affected? And I think that's a really important question that we need to answer. So what does the future hold for us? Um, I hear a lot of positive rhetoric about the UK given, you know, cases have been declining. Um, our rates have been below one. And because, you know, a large part of our population has received a single dose of vaccine, about 15% have received two doses. But what we're actually seeing now is two different pandemics in the UK. And we saw this prior to Easter. So this is actually data from Scotland showing school openings in primary schools, actually, that happened on the 22nd of February, partial openings and further openings on the 15th of March. And we sort of see how rapidly cases rise or positivity rise among children. And here you can see the blue line and um, the orange line, which are essentially young children, primary school children, and the gray line, which is uh, secondary school children. and um, Cases have now declined following uh, Easter break. So we see very much that school, that children infections always track um, school opening and closure, but it's so easy for this a pandemic to get out of control once schools open because we don't have those mitigations in place. And this was only for three weeks before Easter break. So we have yet to see the impact on other age groups. But even then, at that point in time, we saw cases start to rise in Scotland before they started declining again. Uh, so we really need to keep an eye on this um, and not just keep an eye on this, ideally preempt it, which is something that we've never managed to do. Um, these rises were actually almost matched by declines among those vaccinated, which is why we didn't see th that sort of exponential growth in cases, but also because schools were only open for three weeks before Easter holidays. Um, this is not just what these data are telling us. Modeling data from SAGE have suggested that a third wave is uh, highly likely. We've heard from government experts themselves that it's almost inevitable. And we know that, um, you know, there's several different scenarios in modeling, but it's possible that ICU admissions could still exceed the second wave uh, if we are not cautious about reopening and we don't follow the data. Um, so let's look at the data from England now. The data from England also shows uh, something very similar. So when schools open on 8th of March, and they were only open for two weeks before Easter holidays, and even in that period, uh, we found that um, school-age children had the highest positivity based on the Office for National Statistics data, and uh, the prevalence in children exceeded all other age groups, even in that two week period. And following Easter holidays, there was a decline. But what's going to happen now that we fully open schools uh, for a longer period of time, we should expect to see exactly this uh, pattern. But what are we doing to prevent it? Nothing. And if you look at um, uh, the, the data from Public Health England, which is based on symptom-based testing, you see exactly the same pattern. And this can't be attributed just to lateral flow testing because the Office for National Statistics data is based on a general population survey. It's not dependent on testing. And here you can look at primary school children who also don't undergo lateral flow testing, and you see the same pattern in them. Rises when schools open and drops when schools close. Um, and one thing that we never talk about, we talk about looking at the data and not the dates. This is a huge uh, piece of the puzzle, a lot of data that came out a few weeks ago that told us that we are now in the middle of the pandemic after the pandemic, which is happening alongside, uh, which is uh, long COVID. And long COVID is um, essentially having symptoms for long periods of time. We don't understand what the impact of these symptoms are yet in terms of disease, but the early signs are quite worrying because all the studies on this so far show that often these long-term symptoms are associated with uh, organ dysfunction in people. So scarring in uh, heart problems and lung tissue, uh, damage to kidneys, um, as well as neurological problems uh, like difficulty in concentration, memory. We don't know what underlies this, but this is a virus we're just learning about. And should we really be taking these risks with the help of people? What's important to remember is this isn't necessarily a short term disease. So almost half a million people living in the UK at the end of March had symptoms for more than six months. And two thirds of these had at least some impact on their day-to-day -day activities. The majority of people impacted are young and 
with no underlying health conditions. So that sort of really puts into question the approach of gov government, which has been, let's protect the vulnerable and the elderly through vaccination. And it's okay if we have a surge in infections and people get, young people get infected because they don't get severely ill. I think we really have to question that narrative because we are seeing a lot of long COVID in young, healthy adults. And this is data directly from within the UK. And very, very unfortunately, we also have many, many children now living in the UK with long COVID. So uh, between 10 and 13% of children go on to develop long COVID and one in five adults go on to develop long COVID. So it's time we start taking this seriously. Of course, many people will say we have vaccines now, but the problem is there's a lot of uncertainty about vaccines being the sole strategy to take us out of this. They're hugely important. And it's very, very important that as many people as possible get vaccinated as quickly as possible. But it does take time to roll out the vaccine. And in that duration of time, the pandemic can easily get out of control. We are already seeing those rises of infection in children, and we know how quickly they can spread to the rest of the community, particularly among people who haven't been vaccinated. And also, as was mentioned earlier, children are not eligible for vaccination yet. So those who are in ineligible for vaccination form about 21% of the population. And it's very unlikely that we can reach the herd immunity threshold and bring an end to the pandemic without actually vaccinating um, those people, even if there was 100% uptake in the rest of the population, which there's not going to be. There's also a lot of questions about the duration of immunity with vaccinations, which we don't know yet. And of course, with all the new variants arising and circulating now within the UK, there are real concerns about how certain we can be that vaccines can bring an end to this on their own. And the new variants do pose a real threat to the efficacy of vaccines. And if we want to actually protect these precious resources, the best way to do that is to actually prevent transmission. And we could still have lots of cases, lots of people with long COVID, lots of hospitalizations, and sadly, even many more deaths if we allow the pandemic uh, to get out of control at this point in time. And this is not a hypothetical. This is happening in other parts of the world. So in the graph that I showed earlier, Chile was just behind the UK in terms of vaccinating its population or the proportion vaccinated. And this is what's happening in Chile now because there was reassurance that a large part of the population had been vaccinated and there was opening up. Um, and unfortunately, the pandemic got out of control and uh, there were hospitals that were short of oxygen and there was no bed capacity to be admitting patients. And we need to learn lessons from what we're seeing in other parts of the world. Um, what's really worrying is we are seeing many new variants uh, linked to waves of infection across the world. And this is also something we can't be complacent about. We saw this in South Africa in December, and now we are seeing this uh, in different parts of, parts of South America, particularly in Brazil. And very recently, we have identified, we found uh, this pattern in India as well, where we've seen a very, very rapid exponential rise of infections that have increased more than tenfold in um, a span of about four weeks. And this rise in infections actually mirrors the rise in frequency of this new variant, which has now become dominant in many parts of India. Uh, and we need to be really concerned about this. What's really worrying is Maharashtra, which is one of the areas where this variant was first identified, has shown this variant becoming dominant quite rapidly over March and April. Um, and worryingly, uh, the B117 variant, which is the so-called Kent variant that's in the UK, was also present there at the time. Um, I do want to stress that this data is based on really small numbers of sequences because surveillance in India is, is not as robust as surveillance here. But it's worrying that alongside the so-called B117 variant, this variant has gained prominence, uh, at least in this particular state in India. So it's something we need to keep an eye on. Unfortunately, because of the very lax uh, strategy we had towards border restrictions and quarantines in the UK, all major variants of concern and many of the variants under investigation are now within the UK. So that includes sadly the South Africa variant, the Brazil or Manaus variant, and also now um, the Indian variant. And what we've seen with all these variants are that despite uh, surge testing, uh, Unfortunately, they still continue to rise 
even within the community. Unfortunately, we don't have that data for the Indian variant. So much of this rise may be linked to travel. We don't know because there's no transparency about this data. Uh, so we don't know how many cases are within the community and how many are linked to travel. But we do know that both the South Africa and Manaus variant are increasing within the community despite surge testing, something the government told us was very unlikely to happen. And um, I, I want to talk a bit about who has been most affected in terms of health. Um, because, you know, of course, when we talk about living with the virus, who are the people who will have to live with the virus and suffer its consequences? And I think, as was mentioned, the risk in South Asian populations um, and uh, uh, those of Black ethnicity has been about two to five times, uh, two to four times in terms of dying from COVID compared uh, to people who are white. and. Um, uh, there are differences in the first and second wave, but a lot of this change in risk is essentially down to things like deprivation, exposure, occupations, so being in key worker occupations, racism, stigma, discrimination, um, as well as uh, you know living in multi-generation households and uh, to a small extent, possibly comorbidities as well. So a lot of these are sort of structural or institutional factors that are really influencing risk in these communities. And economic consequences have also been disproportionately borne by um, uh, minority ethnic groups. So young black people and the employment gaps have very sadly widened. Uh, 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 among these groups. Women we know have predominantly adopted carer roles. Unfortunately, they've also been uh, very poorly supported in those carer ro roles by government. Uh, so they've had very little support and women are also unfortunately more likely to suffer from long COVID, which is a condition that's largely been ignored by government. Uh, parents, particularly clinically vulnerable parents, but all parents have had to decide between health and education. Some have had to deregister children because they're not allowed to uh, take their children to attend school remotely. Um, they've had caring responsibilities without adequate support. Uh, we know that there's been very poor support for things like remote learning for a long period of time. And of course, they have to live with the day-to-day -day risk of infection to themselves, their families, and their children. Dr. Gudasani, sorry, I'm gonna have to um, okay. move on to Kem Kamiyoshi to round up, thank you. Okay, sure. So I'm, I'm going to skip past that because I think everyone here is aware. I do want to really highlight that the support in the UK currently in terms of um, isolation pay is the lowest in the OECD. And this has a huge impact because four in five people are not accessing testing, even if they have symptoms, and even um, less than half of people have symptoms isolate. So our response to this has been Operation Moonshot, which is more testing, which unfortunately is not going to fix this problem at all. Um, so I think the people who are most likely to be affected in the future are going to be children, young adults, teachers, um, and key workers. Um, and of course, everyone here knows about zero COVID, but I want to say this is not a fringe strategy. Several countries have achieved this. One in four people in the world are living in zero COVID or near zero COVID zones. Unfortunately, we are not one of those. What we need to do is I think what's already been mentioned, we need to control transmission alongside vaccination, support the vulnerable, uh, test trace, isolate and support really needs to be fixed, reconsider prioritization of our vaccine policy, urgent mitigatory measures in schools, border controls with good quarantine measures, regional and global coordination, equitable vaccine access. Um, and I'm just going to put this last slide up to show where we are and where we could be. Uh, and we could easily have achieved this uh, which would have meant shorter lockdowns, less disruption to our children's lives, and uh, less impact, particularly on those vulnerable groups. Thank you. Sorry about overrunning. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gudasani. I'm sorry that we have to uh, rush along. That's all been very interesting, but we, um, we have so many people to get through today. So thank you so much. Our, our next speaker is um, Ian Hodson, who is the president of the Bakers Union, and we're delighted to have him here this evening to outline some of the attacks on workers that we've seen um, during the pandemic um, and under the cloak of the pandemic, actually, through job losses, pay cuts, fire and rehire and other uh, tactics. Ian. Thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to come along and... Uh... I suppose like like a lot of people, uh, you, I, you know, I've been shocked over the last couple of days of because COVID, and apart from the death of obviously Prince Philip, uh, COVID has been the the main news uh, that we've we've witnessed for for the last twelve months. So it's it's been refreshing to see something different on the news. But obviously, you know, 
the, the, the question's got to be asked about this, this, um, this outpouring of condemnation of billionaires about stealing football. And obviously, it's while it's good to say, I'm hoping uh, it's not about uh, the fear of uh, not getting the kickbacks uh, or getting the media coverage. Um, because at the same time, as, as, as this has uh, been going on, we've had reports that have been released and that have shown um, a 37% increase in deaths of homeless people in 2020. Um, and yet I haven't seen any of the outrage about that. There's been a, a report showing that there had been an 83% increase in frontline workers reporting an increase in the need for the use of food banks in the country. Yet no political parties are scurrying around trying to bring hastily arranged meetings with relevant groups of football um, of football fans um, to, to, together like we're seeing political parties do today. Uh, and while football, you know, I recognise is important, I follow football, um, it's not as important as life chances, um, which are, are essential for all of us. Um, and, and as it happens, as a, as a union, we've just conducted our own uh, survey and produced a report which is actually being launched tonight at the STEC. Um, and it's been held across the food sector uh, those that have kept our nation fed, and some of the some of the results will be, you know, quite shocking when, when people uh, get to see them. For example, you know, forty percent of people um, said that they hadn't eaten enough during COVID crisis due to lack of money. Nineteen nineteen percent said uh, they ran out of money to buy food, and over thirty five percent they had gone said they had gone without food, making sure others in the household could be fed. One in five have relied on support from friends or relatives to provide food and more than seven percent of those that have been on the front line feeding the nation have had to use food banks to make sure that they could get meals for themselves and their families. These are our sung, unsung frontline heroes. Now let's put some perspective on it. They work in the food and drink industry which is Britain's largest manufacturing sector. It contributes to more than 28 billion into our economy. It offers and produces more into the economy than all other manufacturing sectors, including automotive and aerospace. And during this crisis, the sector grew a further 2.3%. So it's not like there isn't any money. It's not an important part, an unimportant part of our economy. It's critical and hugely profitable. Yet those that are working in it find in far too many cases, they just can't make ends meet. It does appear in today's society, food workers are not too low to make the food enjoyed by the wealthiest in our society, just too poor to provide it for themselves and their family. And it's why we as a union are supporting the call for the right to food to be enshrined in law. The coronavirus pandemic has exposed vast social and economic injustices and exposed how inequality is more than ever a real life and death issue. Stats have shown a male in the baking sector is 22.7 times more at risk of being killed due to COVID. This is clearly unacceptable, but I do want to add that the figures do tumble in workplaces where we are organising. And the work that our safety reps have done has made sure, in some cases after a fight, that our members have remained safe. Most of the outbreaks that we have witnessed in our industry happened in workplaces that failed to provide company sick pay and expected people to survive on poultry SSP of £13.70 a day, which has already been mentioned. You know, Matt Hancock admitted he couldn't survive on it, yet he did nothing to change it. Rishi Sunak didn't rush out an emergency support measure for those families that needed that support. You know, and that's why we are calling as a union for a, le uh, for a levy to be put onto employers to fund uh, all workers so they can receive at least six weeks full pay and anyone on a zero hours contract receives at least equal to an average of their normal working hours. 
Low pay and job insecurity needs to end in all sectors of our economy. We must end inequality. Nobody's pay should be related to their age. We wouldn't accept it for any other group, so why do we discriminate against young workers? At the outset of this crisis, it was clear how job insecurity had left people being vulnerable to bad bosses. When Tim Martin attempted not to pay his workers until the government furlough scheme kicked in, our members stood up and with great support from people like Diane, Bella and Richard, who's been on this call, that decision was reversed. But unfortunately, where workers were not organised, were not in a union, they haven't had the same successes. And far too many workers on zero hours contracts will literally found themselves abandoned. This cannot be right and shows why it's right to call for the abolition of zero hours contracts. We need to end this low road economy that we've been driving down. We need to make sure when work enhances life and brings security, and we need to make work pay. No one should be earning less than 15 pound. Nobody, nobody should have to endlessly fill in forms to explain their hardship if an employer is struggling to, to meet the 15 pound wage, let them prove they don't have the means to pay their workers. And I know I will say, I will say, I will say this because obviously I often get asked, you know, if we force pay up, will that not mean prices will go up? But I'll just say this to, in answer to those uh, questions. Pay has been low for many, many years, but prices have still gone up. The food costs more today, despite the fact that many have suffered from pay cuts. Rents and energy prices have increased, even though people have, have been taking, you know, pay freezes for all of these years. The time now is to make sure that we build a society that we deserve. The time now is not to take a step backwards, it's to take a step forwards, to make sure that if we want a better society, then accepting the better tomorrow line must be replaced with I'm prepared to storm wherever, including heaven, if that's what it takes to bring a decent society for us all. The right to food, the right to home, the right to a job, the right to equality, the human right to decency should be our right. And let's end and make sure that if we face another crisis like this, people aren't left to die on the sidelines. People aren't left insecure. It's time to come together and act collectively and build better because we deserve it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ian, and thank you for everything that the Bakers Union has been doing throughout the pandemic for workers. Our unions have been fantastic, and I'm not sure where we would have been uh, without them, where workers would have been without them over these this past year. Our next speaker is Ramona McCartney, um, and she's here to speak tonight on behalf of the People's Assembly Against Austerity, uh, which also supports a zero COVID policy. Ramona is going to tell us how the fight against austerity remains a key priority and how it's linked to the struggle for zero COVID. And of course, about how the protest is bubbling up against this government on, on a wide uh, variety of fronts. Ramona. Thanks very much, Bill. Um, thanks for having me this evening. Um, and it was great listening to Ian and Diane. I think made a lot of points that I would like to make as well, but um, I'll try not to rehash everything. But I think that for me personally, and from my, our, our campaign point of view, I think it was really, really important that we look at how we um, how how we were posed when this um, when the pandemic struck. We were in a very, very precarious situation as a society. Why is that? Um, we just have to look at the last 11 years of brutal, brutal austerity. I mean, the whole country, like the very fabric of our society was stripped away, bare to its bone. Um, it just was a succession of underfunding, um, stripping our services, you know, setting up the NHS for failure. We already went, we went into this pandemic with a um, hundred thousand shortage of vacancies within the NHS. I mean, we just were not in a very good place. So the most, the poorest, the most vulnerable in our society, were left really um, in a very, very bad place. And that's something that we can't ever forget. And that's, and we need to really hold the government to account for that. Um, 
Um, so yeah, we, we look where we are now at the present day. Um, it, as was mentioned by other speakers, it's not any strange phenomenon that we um, have one of the highest death rates in the world. Um, that was just, that was completely to do with a, a mishandling of the, the crisis in the early days. Again, we have to hold the government to account for this. We can't let them off the hook. Um, you know, they did, they, they, they suggested a herd immunity program at the very beginning. There was a massive backlash. So they, so they sort of stepped away from that, but um, it would seem that they just carried out that anyway, the herd immunity program anyway. So in my opinion, I think that we really, really have to be holding these people to account. Not only that, um, they use this crisis to siphon off an incredibly large amount of money. I think it's 37 billion that has been taken out of the public purse and into the pockets of their friends. Um, you know, the, the track and trace system, all of this PPE, remember the school meals for the kids. Um, you know, this is scandalous. This is really, really, really poor behavior. Um, and we need to, again, hold these people to account for that. Um, going forward, um, I, we know that the restrictions do lift on the 21st of June. Um, and the People's Assembly have called a national demonstration for the 26th of June. And I know that sounds sort of maybe a bit strange, but we will be very responsible with that demonstration. We will follow any guidelines. It'll be risk assessed. And we will be taking uh, advice from independent SAGE. But that demonstration will be about demanding a new normal. We cannot go back to the old way of working. We cannot let the poorest and the most vulnerable in this country be exposed to the, the, the Tory rule and more and more austerity. They continue cutting benefits. They continue underfunding the NHS. They continue with this program of austerity um, and we can't allow that. We look at after the war, what happened when the country was in an economic downturn. The NHS was founded. Um, there was a huge, a, a massive building of council housing. So out of the ruins of any crisis, we can and we should demand an absolutely new normal. So that's why we have called a demonstration on the 26th of June. Um, and this will be the first time that our movement gets to get back together. Um, we have been isolated and separated from each other for a year and that's been incredibly difficult for some people. And sometimes it's easy to lose hope um, and not know that there you know, we are still together. Our movement is strong. We're not broken. The Tories might have lots of money in the ear of the media, but what we do have as a social movements and trade unions, we have numbers and we need to make the biggest display on that day and get together. We'll march as one and we'll take this right to the heart of the government where we um, assembly at 12 noon in Portland Place and we'll march as one to Parliament Square and we will have our rally there and we'll say exactly how we feel. We'll demand that new normal. There's no going back to the old ways. Um, and so I hope that everyone listening, please do visit the People's Assembly website. You can download a motion there if you need to pass it through your union branch or CLP or whatever organization you're part of. I think um, it's, it's hugely important that, well, on the 21st of June, let's look at the world through that lens. It's hard to see what it's like now, but the pubs will be open, the shops will be open. Um, you know, the, there's gonna be a football fan space in Trafalgar Square with a big screen. So why should we not be there? We need to have the first opportunity to get together, get on the streets and take this to the heart of government and tell the Tories enough demand a new normal. Thanks very much, Belle. Thank you very much, Ramona. Absolutely right. We need a new normal. Our next speaker is Elaine Heffernan, and she's here representing one of those, uh, one of the campaigning organisations that we work with closely, Zero Covid UK. Elaine will be telling us about their campaigning work and future plans. Elaine. Um, yeah, actually, I was thinking earlier today, about it's just I just think it's just a year since Boris made his speech about lifestyle choices and his being overweight 
being what put him into the hands of NHS workers who did have a good grace despite everything he's done to the NHS to save his life to make sure he returned to robust good health and I wanted to kind of just say before talking about the different campaigning things or, or weave it into what I'm going to say really that this huge contract that they have tried to push from the very beginning this, in, this business of individual choices and individual health uh, being what affects what happens in COVID you know whether we're talking about who's most likely to get the virus who's most likely to die who's most likely to be scared of the vaccine and who's most likely to have no choice to break the quarantine rules all of these things are presented to us as individual choices are actually a result of course of an underlying condition and that underlying condition is the social and economic relationships in which we live that create various sorts of oppression and i think at every point in this crisis there's been a choice between the individual greed um, of boris and his cronies and the collective need of society and the world. And I think at every point they've chosen, obviously they've chosen themselves and their class, but in doing so they've, they've widened every existing inequality. And for all his performance about lifestyle choices, as if his choices about weight and lifestyle sprang from the same source as, I don't know, as the young mums that I work with, um, psychotherapist in, in teenage perimental uh, health at the moment, uh, perinatal mental health. And, and most of the young mums I worked with at the beginning had no food in their homes at all. They had no choice but to go out and get money where they could. They have no choice in terms of what they eat. They eat the most unhealthy food because that is what is the cheapest. Or the lowest paid workers in Newham, where I was living until very recently, you know, who were forced to keep you. I'd watch them out of my window. I'd go for my little daily walk before I got sick and I would watch people getting on buses, going to work. I'd, I'd, I'd have to go to the supermarket and I would see my neighbours there working and sometimes working when sick because there was no sick pay. I worked in a children's centre to deliver my service where almost everybody last Christmas, almost everybody got COVID apart from me because I'd already had it, I think. But people were going into work knowing they were ill and they had no option but to do it because they had run out of sick days or because they were afraid they would be bullied. There is not a lifestyle choice when catching COVID is less bad than not turning up to your shift, when you can't get an online shop delivered because you don't have a bank card, even if you could get a slot. We know this, people have kind of said this, really. But, you know, this is, we, we have to keep trying to push back at the myth of the underlying health conditions and the individuality of this. Um, and for us in zero COVID, obviously for all of us, it's really essential that we win the battle to drag track and trace out of the hands of Serco and the other crony capitalists and into the hands of the not-for-profit public sector. Zero COVID Coalition is, is currently mobilizing to support the We Own It Day of Action. And I can see there's a speaker, there's an action uh, next Tuesday, which is really important about getting Serco to not renew the contract, getting the government not to renew the Serco contract in terms of track and trace. It might be quite short notice to set something up or to fix something up, but it, I think it's not difficult to get too involved, you know, to do some small actions next week because it's absolutely critical. We put the maximum pressure on Hancock and the government through our local authorities really to, to take that contract from Serco, not to renew it and to start giving that money to the public sector, the billions that they've spent on themselves should be used and it has to go to the public sector because not only are they, uh, the private sector incredibly inefficient and obviously self-serving but also there are other things that will never be done um, as long as they're in charge that can only come from from our local authorities really you know the push to get a safe free accommodation that happened in Newham and support for those who can't work we can't just have test and trace we have to have you know test track and trace with with isolation that's supported in in, in enough space to be separate to your family and with enough income to be able to uh, survive and to manage anything else is going to continue to to contribute towards a possible third wave and to what people have said earlier about individuals who end up with long COVID. It's a matter of social justice that we have, uh, that we win that battle. So we're asking people to take action next Tuesday. I don't think I need to tell you that there is no such thing as an individual health condition. The, the comorbidities that um, were mentioned earlier you know, those comorbidities for COVID are the health conditions most connected in many ways to class and position in society, but there is literally no individual health condition. Even something as simple or as uh, seems so different as your chances of getting ovarian cancer 
is doubled for women with post-traumatic stress. And of course, post-traumatic stress is highly related to the social factors, including racism and sexual assault. And I think one of the things that we want to get across all the time is that idea that, that this is about society and it's about structures and support for, for, that will protect the whole of society. I'm the disability officer, officer on the Zero COVID uh, UK steering committee. And I always stress that the excess, the excess deaths of disabled people, tens of thousands, I've lost seven friends personally. Um, all of those unnecessary deaths are not acceptable, are not inevitable. They're not a result of people's bodies. They're a result of the interrelationship of class oppression and health. You, you guys will know that, so I'll, I'll stop repeating points that others have made. But I want to say we have an almighty battle on our hands to turn around uh, what's happening and force the protection of our people. And we have an almighty battle to kind of really begin to mobilize ourselves to, to do it, I think, to turn back what's happening. Because I look at the young women I work with, and if I thought it was bad last year, it is so much worse now and getting worse all of the time um, because the cuts that are going to hit the public sector are enormous. Really. So we're kind of thinking about how do we organize now in, in an atmosphere where the new herd immunity really is the idea that vaccination will sort it all out and don't worry, uh, you know, the old and the sick will vaccinate them and it's fine and they're sick anyway. So, you know, tough really. They are getting back to that. I've heard it said recently, I think even by someone in um, the Zoe study that we're near, nearing herd immunity, that will still make people sick, that will still make people get long COVID, that will still make the people who, um, you know, health has already been affected um, by the lives that we all lead in this society, more likely to die. So we can't allow it. So we're thinking these things. We have to think about the vaccine and ensuring that people who are not vaccinated do not lose their rights at work and so on. It doesn't mean that we should let people be sacked, no matter how crazy that marginalised uh, right wing so that was very bad language. No matter how the marginalized group of right wing people push conspiracy theories, they're a tiny, tiny minority. There's a lot of other people who are hesitant. We can't allow companies to sack people who are not vaccinated. We want to win the um, debate in society that we need to have a serious strategy to engage with people, to um, talk to people properly about the risks, about vaccines and so on. We want to make sure that we support, we're supporting the campaigns about migrant equality and health because the, <coughs> the vaccine must be available to absolutely everybody without any checks of papers and immigration status. It must be the vaccine for all, but it must also be, we work closely with Hazard's campaign, we have them on our steering committee. Every workplace really has to become safe and secure. We cannot rely on our bosses saying, well, you're all vaccinated. We're not letting anyone in who isn't vaccinated. We must get safe and secure workplaces and continue um, COVID safety at work and furlough must continue for everyone who's not safe to return to work. So we're continuing to push um, unions to develop zero COVID policies and in another role I'm on the NEC still of the um, UCU union and I'm really pleased to see Jenny speaking here and our union taking that up. I'll finish with a couple of things. The international aspect as Diane and others said the collective well-being requires not only the social justice of vaccine for the whole world, it's absolutely crucial because our own programme of vaccine will be completely undermined if we don't ensure that the whole world um, gets the vaccinations because of the, um, new variety, the new variants that will arise. So we have this weekend, and um, the last thing I'm asking you to support this weekend, there is a day... Uh, an international meeting at one o'clock um, with speakers from Germany, from South Africa, from Ireland, uh, from Brazil, and so on to discuss, um, you know, the questions together internationally. We try and work very closely with people in other um, parts of the world on this. And there's also a Scottish um, event as well on Saturday. And of course, we do support the 26th of June, absolutely but with a caveat really that we want there to be local demonstrations outside of London um, to make sure those who can't safely travel can take part in an online option as well. But we absolutely have to get on the streets to begin to um, turn this back and also to have other forms of protest. The virus is here for some time, unfortunately, and some changes in terms of how we organize are actually quite positive in, in involving 
um, disabled people and other groups of people. So I think we need the online options and the local process as well. That's us, much solidarity to everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elaine. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to go straight on to our next speaker, uh, Mac Krimininski, who is a rep at PCS Union uh, DVLA and a young members organiser. Those who attended our last meeting will remember we heard from one of Mac's colleagues about the ongoing dispute uh, over safety issues and COVID risks at the DVLA. And we're going to hear about the ongoing campaign now, Mac. Oh, thanks, Chair, and uh, thanks, comrades, for inviting me to speak at this rally today. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what's happening here on the shop floor at the DVLA, where earlier this month we went on strike for a week, a historic strike against um, the uh, situation that the boss are putting us in, putting us at risk of COVID. We don't have exact figures, but we know at least 1,400 DVLA workers have downed their tools. Um, I work at the contact centre, which was at the epicentre of the outbreak. It actually started in my zone. Um, with over 300 infections in a matter of weeks. In a strike days, the car park in the contact centre was almost deserted, which was great to see. Um, what happened in the last few months, and especially during that strike period, has taught us a lot. Um, we're often told that everyone is affected by this pandemic the same. And I think it's safe to say we learned through our own experience that that's not the case. We are not all in this together when every other government department was working from home to avoid this deadly virus, our members were forced to attend work, sat a metre apart, back to back. And when we queried this, we were told that working from home isn't possible due to data protection and IT issues. But that wasn't a problem. That didn't stop the bosses working from home. They, they've been doing that since March 2020. This shows the shock and divide between classes that has been exacerbated by COVID. It was also not an issue for other government departments, DVSA, HMRC, and so on. They are all working from home. So when our members were the, are the odd ones out, sitting on a ticking time bomb with a deadly virus going around, we're given excuses. But we said there is no excuse, and we went on strike. I listened to a lot of members come to me with their issues. I've had members with vulnerabilities who were depressed, anxious, and scared because they faced the prospect of returning to work just before the outbreak. They were scared that something would happen to them. I've had members who live with people who are shielded. In. They were attending work every day on, only until very recently. Every day they were worried about putting their loved ones at risk. I've spoken to members who are completely broken by this entire situation. The morale is at an all time low. And this is happening in a, in a state, in a government department. Many DVLA workers can think of situations when either them or their colleagues were treated with contempt. We were treated not like human beings, we were treated like numbers, and like numbers we felt. But through this strike, we are saying we are more than numbers, we are workers and we demand to be safe at work, we demand to be treated with respect. They are saying that this strike will affect more tourists as the country opens up again. Basically, they're trying to put the blame on us. Uh, but let me tell you, if working from home was implemented on a scale that it should be last year, like every other department does, not only this wouldn't be happening, but we would be a lot more efficient than we are now. But they, so, so don't they dare try to put this blame on us. Some people say that the second wave is over and therefore there is no need to strike. And we heard similar arguments in August, just after the first wave has ended. The Tories demanded a return to the office, starting with the civil servants, and look where that has gotten us. Now we have even more infectious strains of the virus, like the Brazilian, Brazilian or Indian variant, which is also a lot more dangerous towards young people like Dr. Gerda Sani said earlier. In countries like Chile, France or Poland, where I'm from originally, we are seeing stories of record infections and the third wave. The reports say that there are a lot more young people in the ICUs than there were in previous waves. So to say that this is not a very real possibility in this country, as well as ignoring what happened in the last year, we cannot afford to keep steep walking into disaster. Even the most optimistic scenarios suggest that the vaccination won't be fully complete until July. And with the way this government has handled the pandemic, I learned what's to take with a grain of salt. This is why it's important for us to take action, for us all to take action. The pandemic is far from over. We demand no return to work until it's completely safe. And we've had so many messages of solidarity from so many workplaces and all parts of the labour movement. We can really tell that what we've done resonates with all workers. 
anything less than what we demand, then, then no return to work until it's safe, means that we are sitting on a ticking time bomb. We have tried to speak to the bosses again and again and raise these issues with them, but they have responded with the same generic answers. They're excluding us from risk assessment and they're withholding the Del Deloitte report from us. What have they got to hide? We have tried to talk to them in their language and they did not want to hear any of it. The contempt of our members stems from the contempt that this Tory government has to public sector workers and all workers actually as a matter of fact. It's not just us um, in the DVLA, it's the nurses who are applauded as heroes. They're receiving a pay raise of 1%. The rest of the public sector is facing a pay freeze. The private sector is, is also in a complete shambles. We, we kept this country running through the pandemic and this is how they repay us. So let's talk to them in the language they will understand, a mass coordinated strike action and direct action. And um, I, I mean, I just like to add that not all this work that we're doing is uh, only done because of the kind permission of the DVLA workers. All the licenses that are being processed, all the vehicles that are being registered, all the calls taken, none of these happen without us, without the working class. And once we realize this power which we have, nothing will stop us. On our own, we cannot make any change, but together we can change things for the better. And in the DVLA, we have realized this through being in a union. But everybody has a part to play though. And it is our duty as socialists and trade unionists to stand together in this fight. So we thank Richard Berger and Diane, everyone who's organized this meeting and everyone else on the left who continues to stand with us during this fight. Um, only, in, only in this way, by consistently building this trade union and labor movement to fight for, for a genuine voice for the working class, can we stop this ongoing COVID disaster imposed by this, by this Tory government that is faced by the working class? And once again, um, thanks uh, everyone for inviting me. Um, I would just like to say in the coming weeks, we are going to be organizing uh, another strike if they refuse to listen to us. So please keep an eye out. Uh, I will post a link to our social media. So please support us on there, donate to our strike fund, attend our public rallies and support us on social media because a victory here at the DVLA will be an example to every all workers in the UK. So uh, that's all I've got to say, thank you. Thank you very much, Mac, and uh, the PCS DVLA uh, have our full solidarity here. Our next speaker is going to be Andy Green from Disabled People Against the Cuts. Disabled people have been treated abominably throughout this pandemic, and one study has even suggested that 60% of all of the people who have died from the virus in this country were disabled. We're going to hear from Andy about that and the ongoing issues facing disabled people and what more can be done um, about this situation. Andy. Thank you, Bob. Um, can I just start by uh, congratulating football fans who tonight um, delayed the start of the Premier League game at Chelsea and it now looks like Chelsea are preparing papers to pull out of the European Super League. Um, and I think... Uh, uh, once again shows that direct action gets the goods and I'd like to kind of um, acknowledge the fantastic work of football fans right across the country in, in rejecting that. Um, I think, you know, uh, you highlighted yourself there about the, you know, the, the staggering statistic around death rates um, that's gone on uh, since day one of COVID. Um, and I think it's, it's, um, it's important, I think, to reinforce what Elaine said earlier um, and to kind of really focus our language around how we speak about what has happened over the last 14, 15 months. Um, these weren't mistakes or failures. Um, a lot of the things that unfolded were decisions. And we know the people who made those decisions and they have names and they have job roles. Um, so I think we should um, acknowledge that because it's important not to talk about these things in the abstract and to root them um, in the very real decisions that very real people made based on people's, their perceived relative value and worth. Um, and that is what has underpinned the whole um, approach uh, around COVID, particularly with how um, it played, played out in terms of disabled people's lives. And I think there were probably two, two real things that. Um, as we look back on the last year, 14 months that are, are quite striking. 
And I think the first issue really is of how easy it all was. Um, and when I talk about easy, I talk about how easy it was to for the government to remove people's rights, um, the rights to social care, um, the rights to uh, health services and medical services where there, there were primary services um, or GPs. Uh, when it came to um, SENs and schools and how they abdicated their responsibilities, when it came to the blanket approach to do not resuscitate orders, which were issued right across the country without consultation often and very often without even the knowledge of those whose lives were being signed away. Um, I think it's important to kind of, you know, reiterate and underline that's it, that 60% um, statistic. And I think we should also acknowledge that a lot of the data being used for government reports and monitoring um, is actually quite old data. And uh, I think in the shakeup post this period, we will find that the, that number will go significantly higher um, as has happened in places like China and Italy um, on first review way back when. Um, and how easy it was to kind of write out the story of those who were dying in, the, in care homes originally um, without those numbers even being recorded. Um, how easy it was on simple things like to just ignore the deaf community and not hold accessible uh, press conferences and updates on a daily basis, which we saw. How easy it was um, inversely or conversely to move to transition for a lot of the big businesses and institutions that we were told couldn't become accessible and couldn't embrace online learning. Um, and how for years and decades, in many cases, disabled people had asked for these um, changes to be made and how actually when economic, uh, when profit was at stake, then these became much more doable than when empowerment, enablement, and access to these products and services was at stake. Um, how easy it was to write off, and we've heard earlier, you know, the, um, the minimum wage hasn't been met under furlough and many disabled workers um, have found themselves in that scenario where they're being underpaid. Um, and not recognize the valuable work that has gone on. And in many cases, those who have been at the forefront have been disabled workers and carers in many of the low paid industries, because that's where many disabled people are uh, the only places that they can find work. Um, how easy it was to discriminate against disabled people, particularly when it comes to the welfare state and benefits. And as we mentioned earlier on, but also as we recover in things like the discrimination which has gone on at all the test events, coming up, uh, which the government has announced, those sporting and cultural events and disabled people being uh, excluded from all of those under a blanket ban. How easy it was to abandon carers to their fate, um, to the isolation and the demands and the lack of support and the psychological impact of that over such a long period how easy it was to ride it out of our communities with things like low traffic neighborhoods, many of whom being run by labor governments, um, again, with, or sorry, labor councils, without consultation or acknowledgement uh, with disabled people or of disabled people and their need to be present in their own communities, particularly with what was going on. Um, and that real denial of services that we saw, statutory services, um, voluntary services and particularly commercial services like access to food and energy if you're on a meter um, or having to order online when you're on a very low income and when you uh, worked on one of the various databases. So all of these things became very easy. But I think probably the most chilling aspect of it is after all of these things happened, how quiet it became and the relative uh, tumbleweed which poured across the country of all of these things unfold. So I think the way to avoid these things going forward is really 
to stop ask how we avoid the incidents going forward and implement the demands that the disabled community has created and involved out of its own experience. Things like the National Independent Living Support Service, which is um, absolutely critical and underpinning another demand, which is the right to independent living, which gives people a right and um, an, a, a mechanism for embracing uh, our whole lives, whether it's housing, education, transport, access to services or any of these things. Um, I think disabled people only have the rights that we have and the lives that we have had that are being ripped away and eroded because of our ability to take direct action and, and go out there and demand it. And I think we must reject the surveillance state in all its forms. And I think we must absolutely embrace campaigns like Kill the Bill. Um, and I think I would urge all disabled people and comrades to come along on the 1st of May at 12 o'clock to Trafalgar Square to support um, the campaign to reject this police bill because all of our rights depend on our ability to take to the street and demand social change. And I think that's going to be a critical battlefield um, as we progress over the coming months. So I'm aware of the time and I'll make room for the remaining speakers, but thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Andy. Thank you so much. Now, our next speaker is Wayman Bennett from Stamp to Racism. Stamp to Racism also supports the Zero COVID campaign, and this reflects um, the hugely disproportionate death toll um, in Black and Asian communities throughout the virus. Wayman. Uh, I want to start off by thanking um, Diane, Diane Abbott and Bell Ribeiro and all the people who've organised uh, Zero COVID, because one of the things that we have to say, you know, one of the reasons why I start to raise and support zero COVID is the deliberate act of denial of what's happened to different black communities and the continuation of the government's insistence that there's no, there hasn't been a disproportionate impact. Anybody who read the British medical journal uh, that produced, it produced a list of um, health workers and doctors that had died um, as a result of, of COVID. And when you read through the names and they put the pictures up, you see, you know, you see Pomamena Ne, you see Yusuf Patel, you see Alpha, Alpha Sadu, and you look after, you see black and black faces, one after the other, that lost their lives as a consequence of well, the impact of, of COVID. And I think that um, there was a slogan that we said was, remember the dead and fight for the living. And I don't think we should forgive or forget because I think, we talk about the fight against for zero COVID and long COVID. I think it's going to be a long fight because the government is in complete denial about where it's at. And on top of that, I think that um, what has been said so eloquently by other doctors and other people on, the, on this, on this um, call is that the virus isn't going to go away and um, neither has the government got any response, a, a real responsibility towards it. Start to raise them to call for a, uh, an inquiry public inquiry into disproportionate deaths. It might be strange for us to be calling for a public inquiry considering that the last inquiry that the government produced, the credit uh, inquiry, I think is deliberately aimed at camouflage, you know, whitewashing uh, exactly what the disproportionate deaths are. They're saying there's no such thing as institutional racism. There's no explanation for, uh, for, 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 the, for, the disproportionate, for the disproportionate deaths. And I think that what we have to remember is when we go look at what's taking place is what the reports actually actually showed. And I think uh, there's a new theory. I want to add a new argument that came out of the uh, British Medical Journal, which it talked about something called social murder by the elected, the unaccountable and the unrepentant. It produced a, a special report on there. And it said that, um, that the conditions that were created by the privileged classes inevitably led to premature and unnatural deaths amongst the poorest classes. And I think that one of the things we have to be clear is about how racism and class discrimination became a deadly uh, compound. One of the things that's interesting is the Biblical Medical Journal in Jamaica produced a report around the first wave that said 474 people had died and pointed out that more Jamaican people of Jamaican actually had died in Britain than they had died in Jamaica. It's not wasn't a question of ethnicity. It was a question of deliberate uh, policies in terms of denying people both PPE. And uh, if we remember originally at the beginning of the crisis, people like Dominic Cummings, who was a central part of government, had to develop, develop the theory of herd immunity. In other words, the way they entered into the crisis kind of explains 
why it is so disproportionate and why you do have to have a global, why you do have to global uh, fight about it. Report after report has shown that the um, people f- who are from Bangladeshi, Pakistani, Chinese, Indian and other Asian, Caribbean are 10 to 50 times more likely to die compared to uh, British white people. This isn't uh, a thing where, as the recent CRED report tries to play people against each other, it's important that we have find a way of fighting back against it. And I think that we are involved in a long fight because this denial of the government, I think it's because of the profiteering that they've been involved in. The profiteering has uh, taken the form of, you know, even Hancock uh, has, uh, you know, has been allegedly involved in terms of investment in his own sister's, sister's firm. So what we're calling for is uh, a, a united fight to join with zero COVID. Zero COVID is possible, providing actually people are put before profit. We are calling for people to join the demonstrations, to oppose the bill that's trying to stop us from silence us. We are for joining the going on the demonstration the 26th of June to make sure that we can be heard as safely as possible. And I think, you know, my final thing is to say this. I find myself in intensive care suffering from uh, COVID, uh, watching people around me die one after the other young mothers, young educators, bus drivers, people in the health service dying uh, in in front of me, Uh, um, both black and white, but disproportionately black. And it's unforgivable. They were saved by the NHS, a service that's been run down. But I do say this, I owe my life, I owe my life to, to, to the NHS, but I also watched those other people die, uh, disproportionately black, and they have no voice. And they have no words for when their children came to them to say goodbye, those that were fortunate enough to be able to do that. So when we're involved in this campaign, I don't believe it's a short campaign, and I don't believe the first, the second, the third wave has gone, but Stand Up to Racism is committed to this campaign because anybody who's been in that situation, that's, that's one thing, you're lucky to survive it. But I believe that the people that held responsible, people should be held responsible for the disaster that befell people, the lack of preparation, the demands that be made disproportionate on the health service to sacrifice their very lives to do that. And I don't forgive that. And I don't forget that. And I think if we have a united fight, forget about all the divisions that take place amongst us. If we have a united fight, we can give voice to those people that have lost their lives and make sure the disproportionate deaths of the government's held responsible for that. So I, I want to um, thank, uh, thank people for their contributions here. And I think solidarity and unity are two watch weapons that can lead to uh, a way of being able to fight. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Wayman. Thank you. Now, uh, we're delighted to welcome our next speaker, who is Kevin Courtney. Uh, Kevin is the Joint General Secretary of the NEU Teachers Union. We all know that teachers have been at the forefront of attempts to oppose the government's reckless reopening measures. And we're going to hear from Kevin about how the pandemic has exposed and made um, poverty worse for children in our schools. Thank you very much, Belle. And I'm very pleased to be here uh, with such a distinguished panel of speakers. Uh, as you said, Belle, I'm from the National Education Union, Joint General Secretary with the biggest education union in Europe, the fourth biggest union in this country. And I think we've been right in the way we've spoken about COVID to this government. Uh, last March, We called for schools to close before they were closing them, but we also said to our members who were were called clinically extremely vulnerable, clinically vulnerable, essentially disabled members, we said, go home, work from home. And we think we've kept people alive by doing that. But we also said to younger members at less risk, We said, we do want you to be in school, working on rotors during that lockdown, because we do need the NHS workers to be able to go to work so the rest of us can be safe. We do need the delivery drivers to be able to deliver groceries so that people can stay at home. So we did call on our members to do that. We think we were right last summer when we had our five tests, and I only wish the government had met those five tests before they opened schools. We called for them to reduce class sizes, to mobilize uh, retired teachers, supply teachers, to get radically smaller class sizes, to find extra spaces so that when they did open schools, we didn't spread the virus. We were calling for rotors 
in the autumn term. We called for schools to be in the lockdown. It was a controversial call in November, but if they had done those things that we were calling for, then there would now have been less deaths and there would have been less disruption of education. And we were right in January when Gavin Williamson and Boris Johnson, and Boris Johnson was on the Marsh show saying it was safe to open all primary schools the next day. And we had a, an online meeting of 40,000 of our members and 400,000 people, uh, members and non-members watching on Facebook. And then uh, many, many of our members put in section 44 letters and the government changed its mind and, and kept, uh, well, open primary schools for one day, but then closed them, went back to key worker and vulnerable only. And that has been really important in getting us to where we are now with the spread of vaccination, that cases are lower. So you can see that there could be a way out of this as long as the government doesn't mess it up again. And so uh, Dr. Gurdasani's points are so well made. We need those mitigations in schools. We need ventilation, and that has to be invested in. It'll get easier towards the summer, but we need it. We need ventilation. We're pleased the government accepted what we were saying, that they should maintain mask wearing. We need to make sure that there aren't in-person staff meetings or in-person parents meetings that can spread the virus. It might be. We keep monitoring the data. It might be that we need to go further and we need rotor operation in secondary schools. Nobody wants that. We want to be able to get through it without doing that, but it's important to keep on the question of the safety because our government has not dealt with that and the union movement has been speaking the truth to power. And uh, like Ian said, where we've had well-organized workplaces, there have been less deaths because of trades union involvement. But you said, Bell, I wanted to say something about childhood poverty. Our members, teachers, support staff in the NEU, have seen inside children's homes through the Zoom calls, through the Teams calls, a bit literally and a bit figuratively, we've seen inside children's lives. So our members saw when they were trying to get uh, online learning set up last March, that many children did not have laptops, did not have broadband. I think some people think that's a luxury to have a laptop and broadband. But if you want to be involved in education, if you want to be part of the world, you really need that now. And we, we certainly couldn't get online education set up without it. And the government failed for so long to deliver those laptops and that broadband. Children only having a connection on their mobile phone connection, that, that data connection, which is nothing like good enough. But then when we got some broadband set up, and some laptops set up, our members looking into children's homes and seeing the children that, that are sharing a bedroom with four or three or four or five other siblings, some of them where, they, where they've got no space to work at home, where their bedroom is the living room, where you see that, you, you, in some cases, teachers talking about seeing damp on the walls in the children's bedrooms. So you see, our members have seen that poverty. It's not that it's, it's not that COVID uh, started all, all of that. It's been there and it's been growing since at least 2010 and the austerity program. But now we've seen it and we can't unsee it. And somebody needs to act on childhood poverty. We, are, we will never have an education system that gets every child to the best of their ability if children are living in such degrees of poverty and with such degrees of inequality. So, not, so now that we've seen that, we cannot unsee it. And we demand that politicians act on childhood poverty. There needs to be a commitment to eliminate childhood poverty. But, I mean, at the very minimum, every child whose family is on universal credit should have free school meals. And those free school meals should happen during the holidays as well as during term time. Because our members tell us that when children come back from holidays, they come back hungry. They are frightened sometimes before the holidays start. A member told us that she was ringing around during the first period of lockdown to talk to children about a reading program that they were doing at her school. She talked to one of the children she was contacting, her, her sister, and her sister was scared about the long weekend coming up. It was just before one of the bank holidays, the long weekend coming up, because this sibling, this older sister who was looking after the child, knew there wasn't food in the house. I tell you, we cannot allow that 
to be the way we organize this country. We can't get the best for these children in educational terms, but it's wrong in so in every every fiber of your being tells you that that level of poverty, which has been exposed by COVID, which will get worse if they mismanage the economy, that cannot be, should not be impacting on our children's lives in these ways. So that, that's what I've joined this call to say. But I want to say, because I've heard other people say it, and I think it's really worth repeating. There is no solution to COVID that is in one country. We, if we let the pandemic, if we try and cope with the pandemic in this country, if we vaccinate everyone in this country, but then we do not vaccinate the rest of the world, if we don't get out of it for the rest of the world, we'll never be clear. New variants will develop and they will come here like everywhere else. So it's vital that we are all part of that movement that says that the vaccine patents have to be suspended. There should be no profiteering from these vaccines that have been developed essentially through public money. There should be no profiteering whoever developed them. And we should be supporting the South Africans. We should be supporting Gordon Brown. We should be supporting other world leaders who are saying, stop that those, va those vaccine patents now. Make it free for everyone or uh, as cheap as possible for everyone. Government's making it free for their population. None of us will be free of this pandemic until all of us are free of this pandemic. Thank you for the invitation to the meeting. Thank you very much, Kevin. And you end on, 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 a, on an excellent point. Our next speaker is going to be uh, Larissa Kennedy, who is the president of the NUS. We're delighted to hear from her again. And Larissa has been a great ally of the Zero COVID campaign and spoken at our meetings before. Larissa. Thank you so much, Bell, um, and also thanks to Diane Abbott um, and folks at Zero COVID for the opportunity to be part of this call, um, and also to all the other speakers. It's been amazing uh, to listen so far. Um, and, you know, like so many others, like your members and, and so many of you, students have also been really hit hard by this pandemic. And, and really, frankly, we are exhausted, um, you know, throughout the pandemic. We've been infantilized, we've been scapegoated, we've been exploited for fees and rent, we've been pushed from pillar to post because this government refuses at every single turn to deliver for students. And, you know, students and workers at colleges have faced masses of upheaval. And, you know, working class students, disabled students, black and brown students have disproportionately experienced digital poverty, very similar to what Kevin was saying there. And, you know, we've seen the access to education has become a postcode lottery. Um, and that's a core concern for us as a union. Uh, we've also seen, you know, on, on average, university students have paid over a grand in rent for empty accommodation. And that number is rising every single week. And that's on top of a system that already extorts students to, to individually bankroll what should be a publicly funded service. Uh, and so you've got most home students paying £9,250 a year and countless international students paying tens of thousands of pounds each year too. Uh, and over the past few months, we've seen students fenced or locked into their homes. Some have patrol dogs outside. We've seen students abused by security forces and police on their campuses, particularly students of colour, all sorts. Uh, and so, yeah, we're exhausted to say the least, but we're not just exhausted for ourselves. We're also exhausted for workers on our campuses because we're organising in solidarity with academics who've been facing precarity and poor conditions, with outsourced maintenance workers who university management treat as disposable when they're anything but. And our anger towards this government also extends to our roles as members of the communities that we're part of, whether that's the place we've lived our whole lives or somewhere that we've chosen to call our second home in our time as students. Um, so, so I guess we, we've been asking, asking the question, where do we go from it here? Because this year students have organised the, the biggest wave of rent strikes in the history of the student movements. Students have staged occupations, done direct actions, won millions of pounds in rent rebates, uh, but there's so much more yet to go. And, you know, right now we're using this time to, to strengthen the tools in our toolbox across the student movement so that we can organise bigger and bolder than before. And right now at NUS, 
Uh, we're really, really happy to be working alongside um, the World Transformed um, and the Red Square movement, which is made up of the likes of uh, the, the Rent Strike movement and Liberate the University and other such student-led grassroots organisations um, to build an organising school that we're doing this weekend. And um, I guess I'm sharing this because I think it's so important that we harness the energy right now. When it comes to the student movement, that's the energy coming from the rent strikes and the anti-fees campaigns. But I'm also hearing from so many others who have been organising through the pandemic um, that this is sparked stuff, stuff in a lot of people. It's about recognising a lot of these problems that we're facing. They're not caused by the pandemic. They're not caused by a virus. They are problems that were sewn into the fabric of our society, some of which have been sewn into the fabric long before I was even born. Um, and so, you know, this is about organizing to win, yes and now, but also into the future. Um, uh, and so for, for us at NUS, um, for students, that looks like winning economic justice. Uh, we wanna see direct payments to students. Um, some people don't know, but students can't access benefits for the most part. They can't access the usual routes of support, which, you know, even though they've been completely decimated under Tory austerity, are necessary for so many people. Um, and students don't have these options. And, and the government thinks that's OK because they all went straight from their fancy schools to their fancy unis to their fancy jobs. And they don't have a clue what it's like um, for the student parents and carers, the, the care leavers and estranged students and all the other students who are at the brink financially who desperately need and deserve that support. Um, but, but And they also tried to frame it as impossible. Uh, but, you know, we've seen in Northern Ireland that every student received a £500 direct payment um, towards, you know, the disruption that they faced. Uh, where here, you know, we've seen um, some hardship funding that would actually equate to a few quid per student. So there's massive disparities for students right now. And, and so we're fighting for equity and getting those um, direct payments and securing economic justice for all. Um, but it also doesn't end there because we need to see the return of maintenance grants in line with a living student wage. The fact that, you know, students who don't come from money, students who don't have support coming from elsewhere need to work alongside study. That is baked into the student finance system. The assumption that people will work uh, sometimes multiple jobs, jobs alongside studying is baked into that system. We know that half of students spend three quarters of their student loan on housing in a normal year, much less in a pandemic year where, you know, the jobs people would do in, in hospitality and leisure and retail have dried up um, or, are you know struggling to get them or keep them um and nine percent of students have had to access food banks i come back to that figure a lot because i think it's really damning um that you know a student finance system that is supposed to enable people to be able to afford to access education have left so many people struggling um, and, and this is something that you, there's a structural issue here, right? Like year on year, students are talking about financial struggles as a core reason for poor mental health. Like all of these things are interlinked. Um, and so we're also saying on top of, of demanding of government that we get direct payments, we're also talking here about needing to change a system that is broken. Um, and that, I guess, speaks to, to the last, but definitely not least part of, of things that we're demanding of government, which is needing a fully funded, lifelong, accessible education system. Because when universities are run like businesses rather than public services, and when students are treated like consumers rather than learners, the only people who win are university management and Tory government. They get to shirk responsibility for the fact that student nurses who have graduated early to support the NHS through this pandemic have had to saddle themselves with debt in order to do so. They get to shirk themselves, shirk responsibility for all of the mess that's been created this year um, because it's not up to them. But it is up to them. We know that it's up to them. And with your solidarity, with your support, we will win direct payments. We will win student grants and we will win fully funded education. Um, and we also want to stand in solidarity with you folks. Honestly, it's been um, so energizing to me um, 
listening to the energy across you know various movements and, and where we're all going uh, and for us I do hope you'll sign our petition and share it and support uh, the work and so on and I'll, I'll drop some links in the chat afterwards but please I want to know how how students can also pour into um, your movements of support and stand in solidarity with you folks really tangibly because um, you know that's how we win that's how we win and I'm, I'm really excited that we're building spaces that and it's having conversations like this where we're connecting our struggles, building that solidarity, building that unity, uh, and long may it continue. So thank you again uh, for having me. And I'll have Thank you so much, Larissa, and for your continued support and everything you're doing for students right across the country. Uh, to complete our lineup from the education unions, we're very pleased to hear from Jerry Sherrard, who's the head of the Equality and Policy um, is the head of equality and policy at the UCU. Uh, lecturers and academics have seen job losses, change in terms of unsafe working conditions being posed uh, throughout the pandemic. And Jenny's going to tell us a little bit about the UCU's campaigns and priorities. Jenny. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Belle. And it's uh, fantastic to be here this evening. Thank you for inviting me uh, on this really important topic. And thanks to all the speakers so far for their excellent and really energising contributions. Um, as we seek to deal with the long, short and the long term impacts of the pandemic, it's absolutely vital that we keep at the front of our minds uh, the fact that the pandemic has had a deeply disproportionate impact on certain groups and communities. At UCU, we have been clear from the outset that the priority for decision making has to be the health and safety of staff and students in post-16 ed education, as well as the local community communities where they're situated. Suppressing the virus is absolutely critical, not just to protect people from COVID itself, but also from the real mental health implications of the endless cycling in and out of lockdown that we have seen as a result of this government's disastrous policies. In a recent survey of our members, three in 10 respondents said they didn't feel safe at work. That number rose to 62% of respondents working in prison education. And I know that you will join me in sending solidarity to our members in Novus Prison Education who have recently announced three days of strike action over health and safety concerns and the employer's failure to engage on that. Keeping people safe is why we have consistently called for learning to move and stay online wherever possible until the virus is properly under control. And it's also why UCU launched a judicial review in October to challenge the government's decision to ignore sage advice and encourage students to return to campuses. Because we know that sadly the government's decision was not motivated by the best interests of students or staff, but because the government didn't want to get behind the university sector and underwrite lost income from students. It's a real privilege to follow on from Larissa um, who, who's a really inspiring speaker and it's been our union's privilege to stand in solidarity with students fighting for economic justice as she's outlined because Covid has really only emphasised the degree to which the marketised model in post-16 education is driving bad and often dangerous decisions. Decisions for which staff, students and staff are paying the price, whether through risks to physical and mental health and safety, attacks on pain conditions or through cuts to jobs. Jobs like those at the University of Leicester, where UC members have just voted to take strike action over plans to make 145 staff redundant. Again, I know you'll want to send me in joining, uh, join me in sending solidarity to, to all the staff in that branch. Of course, as many speakers this evening, including Elaine, Andy and Wayman, have articulated in alarming detail, we know that the marginalised communities are at the sharp end of the government's decisions and their impact both in society and in the workplace. So it's little surprise that our recent survey found staff who were black, disabled, LGBT plus, migrant and women were all more likely to report feeling a lot more stress since the pandemic began. That the survey found that increased workload is associated with the shift to online learning in post 16 education is having a disproportionately negative impact on the mental health of staff in these groups. So as we think about how we move forward from the pandemic, we need to be putting equality at the heart of our fight. As others have said, we need to loudly and robustly reject the government's attempt to downplay these unequal impacts and pretend in the face of overwhelming evidence that structural equality simply doesn't exist. We need to ensure that all of our organising activity in our union branches and in our communities centres the experiences of those who have been hardest hit and press is for greater accountability from employers and the government. 
We need to be making the case for investment in things that will make a real change for those who have borne the brunt of the pandemic. So we need to be trying uh, campaigning to stamp out job insecurity. Uh, you know, we know that those in precarious contracts are, are having to, to navigate this pandemic in an increased state of anxiety because uh, their, their jobs simply aren't secure. And that's a really widespread issue within our sectors. We need to be investing in accessible lifelong learning opportunities, even at a time when, when lifelong learning should be a, a real priority of investment. We're seeing the government threatening to withdraw and claw back funding from the sector um, for, for, for non-delivery, even though it's the government's own policies that has, has meant that some delivery of, of uh, further education is, is not possible as it normally would be. And finally, we need to make the case for lifting up the lowest paid across our society. Because COVID isn't going away anytime soon, as others have said, and we must be sort of steadfast in our commitment to suppressing it both at home, at home and abroad. Uh, similarly to, to what Larissa said, it's been really energising to hear from everyone here this evening. And I, I know that there is such a lot of, um, of commitment to, to, to really taking the fight to the government on this. And, and I'm really pleased that UCU could be here tonight um, and, and play a part in that. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jenny, and, and for everything the UCU is doing. Our next speaker is Claudia Webb, who is the MP for Leicester East and another great supporter uh, of our campaign. She has spoken out brilliantly on both local working conditions in her constituency, the impact of what's been a never ending lockdown there, as well as key international inequalities. Claudia. Uh, thank you, Belle. And it's a pleasure to join you all for this important event. And I would just like to thank Diane Abbott and the Morning Star for coordinating the Zero COVID Coalition and organizing these series of rallying events. You know, the mainstream media would have you believe that the government ought to be congratulated for the success of the vaccine rollout. Yet we know that such success, that that success is misplaced. It's our NHS who should be praised. It's, it's, so in, it's absolutely important that we do not forget the staggering incompetence which has defined the government's response to the pandemic. We saw how the government prioritised the economy from the initial herd immunity strategy, the eat out to help out scheme, and the rush to allow people into high streets to do their Christmas shopping. We now have the highest number of excess deaths in Europe, one of the worst death rates in the world, and, also, and are also facing our worst recession for over 300 years. So you see, at every stage of this crisis, the government has dithered and delayed before taking common sense actions, which were then far too late. Tragically, this cost an unimaginable number of lives of the, over the last year. And yet the government's litany of failures just continue. In Leicester, we have been under lockdown or enhanced restrictions longer than any other area in the UK. I mean, we literally have not been allowed to hug our loved ones since March 2020. We know that the virus has disproportionately affected black communities. African, Asian and minority ethnic communities have been left at greater risk of COVID-19 with people more likely to live in cramped and multi-generational housing in areas of deep inequality and poverty and who hold public facing jobs. The virus has also exposed the deep class inequalities. Workers in Leicester's garment industry are to this day still being paid far less than the minimum wage, are working in conditions which are not COVID safe, are on zero hour contracts, and are working long hours, which are putting them at greater exposure to the virus, whilst billionaire brands simply profit from this exploitation of the working class. Yet we are still here. We are still here in Leicester, in the top 10 cities of stubbornly high infection rates. The disproportionate suffering of areas like Leicester is a damning indictment of the government's failure to prioritize public health and implement a zero COVID strategy to suppress the virus. The recent budget was an opportunity, an opportunity to ensure that the government does not make the same mistakes again, yet instead 
it barely covered over the cracks created by their catastrophic handling of the pandemic. The government are governing in the interest of billionaires and the corporate elite, whilst they prioritise NHS handout contracts worth millions to their friends and donors. They fail to ensure that the basic statutory sick pay is increased to a living wage and made available to all workers. The government should have made it simple. If you get contacted by testing trace, you must be provided with the material means to isolate. It was estimated at the peak of the virus, at least 20,000 people a day were not complying fully with isolation orders, allowing the virus to spread. And why? Because they couldn't afford to do so. This is not due to moral failures on behalf of the public, but because it's impossible for people on poverty pay to comply with guidance on self-isolation and social distancing. They failed to ensure this for working class people in Leicester and across the UK. They were happy to squander billions to enrich private companies, but flinched at ensuring that people were not faced with a choice between destitution or infection. So furlough must be extended and fixed so that no one receives less than the minimum wage and public services wages must be increased. The notion of cutting universal credit must be abandoned and instead it must be increased further. The mortgage holiday, eviction ban and support to renters must be strengthened. The unscrupulous bosses and their disgraceful fire and rehire tactics must be opposed. We need an end to no recourse to public funds and status now for undocumented migrants. The government's handling of the pandemic has been defined by a belief that there is a trade-off between health and the economy. It's clear which side they are on, as they have consistently prioritised private profit over public health. Yet this is a false dichotomy. Across the world, countries that have pursued a zero COVID strategy are returning to normality with all the economic benefits that brings. So we must continue to campaign hard to ensure the government follows the best examples set by countries across the world and adopt a zero COVID strategy. This is the only way to prioritize the protection of everyone in the UK and especially those who the virus has disproportionately affected. Far from the Far from the Prime Minister's insulting comments that we must thank greed and capitalism, the undoubted success of the vaccine rollout is a credit to our NHS, which is a gleaming beacon of human and socialist achievement. Yet despite this, the government risks once again wasting, wasting the sacrifices of the British people during this latest lockdown. Ours is also a global struggle. The UK has three times the vaccine needed for its entire population. Yet countries like Africa on the current projections because of vaccine nationalism are not expected to be vaccinated until 2023. So we on the left must continue to fight for a society which is built around people's needs, health and well-being. Thank you. Solidarity. Thank you very much, Claudia. Thank you. Um, we are running a little bit over time, but we are nearly there. Our next speaker is Kat Hobbs from We Own It, which complains about privatisation of public services. Kat. Thank you, Belle. Thanks for inviting me. It's brilliant to be part of this evening. Um, this government's ideological commitment to privatisation and outsourcing and to cronyism, really, and corruption is costing people's lives and sanity in this pandemic. We've talked tonight about the impact and how insecure workers, disabled people, students, people in care homes, Black, Asian and ethnic minority groups have all been hit hardest. And we've talked about the outrageous death toll of 150,000 people. Every one of these people is an individual. It could be a mother or father, grandmother or grandfather, brother or sister, friend or neighbour. And our government has let down these people and our NHS again and again. And it's the decision that it's made to outsource and privatise again and again that has cost lives. I want to highlight a couple of examples. 
Firstly, it failed to protect people with PPE. We all know this, but many people don't realize that the NHS supply chain, which is part of the NHS, but has been privatized, was originally supposed to be responsible for procuring and delivering PPE during the crisis. It has been privatized. So that means that companies like DHL, Unipart and Deloitte are installed within the NHS, making decisions about how to procure and deliver PPE. And they're in charge of billions of pounds worth of NHS money. This started back in 2006 when NHS logistics was outsourced. And in 2017, a new model was introduced which promised savings through outsourcing. What it's meant in practice is a chaotic mishmash of private contractors, all with a different role to play. 11 different outsourced procurement contracts and four levels of profit taking between the equipment, the PPE equipment being made and it arriving at the hospital or care home where it's needed. And what this meant was that when push came to shove, the NHS supply chain ended up rationing supplies of PPE. The government told NHS trusts that they weren't allowed to buy their own PPE and contracts with private companies were protected instead of just responding to demand. So the national stockpile of PPE and the system that we needed wasn't there for us. And instead, as we know, the government set up new contracts with private companies including a high priority lane for uh, PPE leads. So if you knew a government official, minister, MP or peer, then you would be 10 times more likely to win a contract, the National Audit Office found. Did this work? No, it didn't. It meant that we had lots of different private companies involved um, getting, their con getting contracts uh, because they happen to know someone in power. And for example, the government spent more than 150 million pounds of our public money on 50 million face masks from Ianda Capital that couldn't be used because they didn't meet NHS safety standards. It was a total mess. And what all of this meant in practice is that NHS staff, patients, care staff and care home residents weren't protected the way they should have been. And that led directly to deaths. Secondly, as we've talked about a bit this evening, test and trace has been privatized. While we've seen with the vaccine delivery what our public NHS can deliver, the government decided to use its emergency tendering powers to bring in a whole range of private companies to deliver test and trace instead of relying on the NHS and local public health teams. As we've seen, it's wasted £37 billion on a test and trace programme that has totally failed to deliver. Um, and we know that this programme wasn't just about delivering test and trace because Serco CEO Rupert Soames was on the record as wanting to use this contract to cement the position of the private sector. And we also know that junior health minister Edward Arger previously worked at Serco, which is just unbelievable to me. This money should have gone to local public health teams and our NHS. The Public Accounts Committee has found that we've wasted billions for no measurable difference and they've said that British taxpayers have been treated by the government like an ATM machine. PPE and test and trace are the most shocking examples, I think, or are very, two very shocking examples of what's gone wrong. But the bigger context is that we've had years of privatization and years of austerity, which has left our NHS fighting this crisis with one hand behind its back. We know that three out of four of us want the NHS to be reinstated as a fully public service after the pandemic. People want the NHS to expand and to be able to deal with the backlog resulting from COVID. Instead, we've got a government that has failed to give NHS staff the pay rise they deserve, and it's forcing the sell-off of NHS land instead of expanding capacity. As a result, we've got increasing numbers of NHS patients being treated by private providers. And the NHS is on the verge of signing a 10 billion pound contract with private hospitals, which would run all the way to 2024 to deal with the backlog. This is entirely the wrong approach. But as Chomsky said, that's the standard technique of privatization. Defund, make sure things don't work, people get angry, then you hand it over to private capital. What we need is for the NHS to be able to provide it for itself and to stop all outsourcing to private companies. It should be properly funded with enough staff and a pay rise for staff. It should shred its own documents, for example, so that it doesn't rely on companies like Topwood, which we just found out this week is owned by Matt Hancock's family. 
the NHS should produce its own medical equipment like vials for COVID tests so that it doesn't rely on, for example, Matt Hancock's former pub landlord. The NHS should insource NHS supply chain and produce its own PPE for staff so it's really prepared for any future crisis. We should insource all cleaning, catering and laundry services, which we know would improve standards. The NHS should be building its own hospitals instead of relying on hugely expensive PFI deals. And of course, it should be responsible for caring for patients directly and dealing with the backlog directly. We need to end the internal market that's wasting 4.5 billion up to possibly 10 billion a year. And we need to stop giving money to private providers, end the role of the private sector. The government's been given credit in the media for doing that, but that is not what its latest plans are about, sadly. I want to highlight a couple of things that you can do. Um, I know that everybody's got lots of fights on at the moment, um, but there's two things coming up. At We Own It, we're fighting alongside Keep Our NHS Public and many others against the takeover of GP practices by the American health insurance company, Centene. Centene has taken over 49 GP practices, mostly in London, and we want to fight to get them kicked out. Uh, as of this week, 67 MPs have now publicly opposed the takeover, which is brilliant. Um, and we're having a day of action on Thursday, and I will share the link um, in the chat. It would be amazing if people on this call can join us. It's a very simple action that you can take to show that you don't want Centene at your GP practice. But we own it. We're also fighting for local public health teams to be getting the powers and the money they need to deliver test track trace and isolate instead of Serco and Co. And again, we've got another day of action next Tuesday, the 27th, against Serco. And we really need as many people as possible to get involved. Um, so I really hope you can join us um, for one or both of those days of action. I'll share the links in the chat. Um, it will be wonderful to have your support. And thank you again for this brilliant initiative. It's great to be part of it. Our NHS belongs to all of us. And now is the time to defend it. Thank you very much, Kat. Now, our final speaker this evening is Zita Holborn, and she's representing um, the, as the chair of the Artists' Union. Um, and Zita also tells us in her capacity as the National Vice President of the PCS Union um, that she's raised awareness of the Zero Co COVID Coalition in the Union and there's actually an NEC motion, which includes working with the Zero COVID Coalition going to the National Conference in June, which is fantastic. Zita. Thanks very much, um, Belle, and greetings, everybody. Um, Artists Union England <coughs> is the, um, the union for visual artists. Um, the majority of our members are self-employed. Um, the government measures that were put in place for self-employed people um, didn't include the majority of our members. Most of our members are socially engaged um, artists who work in the communities with vulnerable people, promoting equality, promoting our rights through the arts. And because um, they're very low paid and they don't get regular work in the arts, they have another job that they do part time. And because of that, they fell between the, the gaps when it came to government measures. Um, and also for those who are new, newly self-employed, they didn't meet the criteria that the government set. And for most of our members, uh, and not just our members, workers across the arts and culture sector, um, they found that their work was cancelled suddenly mm -hmm. and immediately and um, with um, no uh, likelihood in the foreseeable future of seeing it return. So that was the end of any work that they had lined up. A lot of artists have studios which they rent and they pay rent for, and they have rogue landlords who don't treat them well, not proper health and safety uh, adequate at all. And yet they still had to pay for those studios, even though they haven't been able to access them because we've been in lockdowns and it hasn't been safe for people to gather. That means they can't create art, they can't create work to generate income, yet they're stuck with this um, cost of paying for studio as well as whatever mortgage or rent they have for the home they live in. And um, there's a disproportionate impact on women and black and Asian people working in the arts. The majority of our members are women 
And we've seen a 44% drop of black women, black and Asian women working in arts and entertainment during this pandemic. 70% of those who worked for an employer um, who are working in arts and culture um, were furloughed. So that's a drop in their income um, and meaning that has a knock on impact on their family and their ability to live and to survive. And in addition to that, a lot of um, black migrant and women workers in the culture sector are working in, uh, on the front line in facility management roles. So in my other union, PCS, we represent um, workers in museums and galleries, and they will be working in the shops in the museums and galleries. They are the cleaners, they are the security guards. They were already low paid um, and working in um, two tier or even three tier work uh, forces where they were outsourced precarious and on low pay and fighting even for a living wage and um, they are disproportionately black migrant and women workers who are losing their jobs in this pandemic. People like Amanda Walker who is one of our PCS equality reps working for um, Royal Historic uh, Palaces. She, Amanda made history in 2017 as the first black woman warden at the Tower of London. And her employer, Hampton Court Palace, um, have um, targeted her for redundancy. And this came after she um, they accused of setting the wrong tone in communications she sent them around equality. And she worked tirelessly and fought for equality, race equality and all equality, and to tackle harassment and bullying in the workplace. So we call on all of, all of you, please, to sign um, the petition on 38 degrees, reinstate Amanda Walker. And um, the, the past for arts and culture workers wasn't brilliant. It was pretty bad because of all the things that I've already just set out. Um, uh, workers in the arts are not even treated like workers. Um, they are, um, and I'm finishing, uh, Chair, um, they, they are treated like they can live off thin air and they should create work um, uh, and art um, out of the love of it. So at our AUE AGM um, a few weeks ago, we um, uh, agreed a, a culture strategy for recovery, but actually we need to work um, internationally because um, arts and culture workers work across borders. And this, this is my final uh, uh, point, um, Belle. And so um, I'm really proud to have worked on and produced um, a cultural recovery strategy, an international one for Public Services International, which is a, um, an, a global uh, union federation. And this really impacts on us in terms of working across borders because Brexit has impacted on the ability for arts workers to come in and for us to go out. And we depend on being able to tour, to gig, to have exhibitions globally. And in our manifesto, we've rejected the commodification of culture. We've called for dignified working conditions, for cultural democracy, for an end to precarious work, for equal pay, for um, no policing of borders, for decolonization and an end to discrimination and a focus on young people for recruitment and retention and for the future. And my final point is that art is for everybody. Um, it, it impacts economically on the ability to access the arts, not just work in the arts, um, you know, because we're facing an economic crisis, not just a, a pandemic. And so it's crucial for healing, for equality, for justice and recovery um, that arts are able to thrive and survive. And we need zero COVID, we need zero um, uh, discrimination, and we need arts and humanity to be taken together. Thank you, Belle. Thank you very much, Sita. Thank you to all of our speakers this evening. And of course, thank you to those of you that have joined us on Zoom and on, on various other platforms. It's, it, it's so important that we look um, beyond the pandemic and we look at ways in which that we, we can improve um, the lives of the people who have been the most impacted um, at, at this particular time. Um, and we shouldn't let that inequality uh, continue 
in the future. So thank you for everybody that's contributed today and everybody that's listened. Uh, please do take a quick scroll through the chat and have a look at all of the links that have been put through about the various campaigns. There are many different things that are going on and we need to do as much as possible to support them all. Thank you for your time this evening um, and, and have a good night.